Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really fantastic to welcome so many of you to this um, seminar on the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. It's a joint um, CELS um, Centre for Public Law and uh, the Latifax Centre uh, Venture. Um, I'm very grateful to all of my colleagues who have agreed to speak and particularly to Marcus Goering, who's uh, done the legwork to pull all of this together. Now, I think a lot of us have spent quite a lot of time uh, with the TCA, probably more time with the TCA than we have with our own families over Christmas, which may be to our benefit or to our detriment. But the fact is, this is a really difficult text. And so what we're saying today is really a first dive into the text to try and work out uh, the structure, uh, what it's saying and some of the key messages. So I'd like to turn now to Marcus, who is kindly chairing the first section on the main elements of the TCA. Marcus, over to you. Marcus, your video's off. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And uh, we should go um, straight into our first panel. Um, let me briefly introduce um, our uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, we'll start uh, with uh, uh, Lauren Bartels, who uh, is a reader in uh, international trade law and will talk to us about international trade, including covering the difficult provisions of uh, rules of origin in the TCA. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Catherine Barnard, who's a professor of uh, EU and labor law uh, in the University of Cambridge. Uh, presenting on uh, services and the institutional arrangements. And our final speaker is uh, Professor Kenneth Armstrong, uh, who has a chair in European Union law in the university. Uh, welcome to you all. Laurent, you have the floor. Thanks, and hello, everybody. So my um, task is very briefly to outline some of the main points um, on on how the TCA deals with uh, trade in goods. And in a way, my job is easy um, because the TCA is fairly uh, normal among FTAs when it comes to trade in goods. But what does that mean? Um, I mean, the world that we have left was not one of a normal bog standard free trade agreement. So maybe one of the ways that I can explain what's going on with the TCA is to contrast it um, in, in some ways to uh, the uh, arrangements that we have now left at the end of the year. So I want to do this um, in three parts. Firstly, I want to talk a little bit about duties. Uh, secondly, about regulations. And then thirdly, what are called trade remedies, uh, which are a type of duty, um, but they are treated slightly separately. So I'll do them at the end. As far as duties are concerned, um, as much advertised, um, we have no duties uh, on goods that move between the EU and the UK, or so you might think. Um, that's actually not quite true. We have no duties on goods that move between the EU and the UK, provided that they originate in the EU and the UK. And that is a major difference between a free trade agreement and a customs union, which is what we've left. So with a customs union, once the product is in the territory of the customs union, it doesn't really matter where it entered, whether it came via uh, Hanover or last year, London. Uh, the same customs duty was applied. And so once the good was inside the wall, uh, it was treated as equivalent to domestic products and moved around quite freely. Now, that's not the case anymore because the duty rates are going to be different. They are different, in fact, a little bit at the moment between um, the UK and the EU. And one would expect that these will diverge uh, over time. And that means that it's important to make sure that the free trade agreement only covers from the EU side UK goods, and from the UK side, EU goods. And the old saying is a free trade agreement is only as good as your rules of origin. And most of the negotiations on trading goods um, are actually to do with rules of origin. So what are these rules of origin? Well, um, the 
they are very complicated and they will keep us all going for a long time. Um, essentially, there needs to there are different ways of doing it. Um, the uh, way this agreement does it is in part, because there are other ways of doing it even within this agreement, that there's got to be half of the product has to come from the UK, if we look at it from that point of view. Um, which is actually, in some respects, a generous rule of origin. Um, but uh, we've already seen in the news where this doesn't exactly work. So what if, for instance, some of the product comes from the EU? Well, in fact, there is a rule called cumulation, which says it's all right if some of the product comes from the EU, the input comes from the EU. So it doesn't really matter whether the originating parts of the product are UK or are EU, um, except as we've seen, there has to actually be something happening to the product for all of this to work. So a product that comes from the EU, a totally EU product um, that comes to the UK on a truck uh, is unpackaged in the UK from, or you know, unwrapped or whatever, and then sent back to the EU, which is commonly what happens with products coming over the so-called land bridge into Ireland, um, is not an originating UK product. Um, it's not for the purposes of um, getting back into the EU anymore an originating EU product because it's left the EU and therefore it gets hit with customs duties um, potentially twice. And this is a real problem. It means that you can't just operate as a distribution hub of products to which nothing has been done in the UK. So um, this is... Um, uh, a genuine problem, uh, which is going to see products being rerouted around the UK for distributional purposes. What else can one say about rules of origin? Well, um, they are extremely complicated. I mean, I'll give you an example. When it comes to fish, you decide on whether the fish originate according to how many, uh, what proportion of crew members have the relevant nationality and uh, uh, where, the, where the boat is flagged and that sort of thing. So this is a major difference at a, a sort of um, simplified level of uh, what we've got now as a free trade agreement and a customs. And moving on very quickly with regulations, this is also very significantly different from the single market now, not a customs union, but the single market. And essentially we've got two levels to talk about. There are the rules, which we can call standards to simplify a little bit, which is basically to say, you know, uh, what's in a product, um, and sometimes how it is made. And these were, of course, largely the same. And if they weren't the same, they were treated as being functionally the same in the EU, according to a principle called um, mutual recognition of standards. But in addition, there's another level, which is the checks. And the checks uh, go by the name of conformity assessment, mainly, or when it comes to agricultural products, uh, there are, there's a different terminology that is used, control and approval processes, which means that even if um, a product from the UK is made according to the same standards and nothing has changed since the 31st of December, um, that doesn't mean that it can be certified as meeting that standard, which is still equivalent to the EU standard from the EU's point of view. They want to now conduct their own checks to make sure that the UK product meets the EU standard, which happens to be the same as the UK standard. And this is where a lot of the friction at the border comes in. Now, it's exacerbated when the uh, standards themselves vary, which we haven't seen yet, but I expect we will see soon, particularly with genetically modified organisms. But even when the standards are exactly the same, the EU is imposing checks. Now, whether they can do this is an interesting question. I mean, this story of the Dutch taking away the ham and cheese sandwiches from the drivers, frankly, uh, I mean, it's obviously ridiculous, um, but more importantly, um, I wonder whether legally under the TCA it's even permissible because these checks are subject to a condition that uh, they address risks in a proportionate manner. And it's absurd to say that those ham and cheese sandwiches are any more dangerous than they were. I'm not saying they're safe. Um, the point is, are they any more dangerous than they were? Uh, and, and they were treated as being the same. So there's, there's work to be done there. Obviously, that's a trivial example in economic terms, but it does illustrate the point. The EU has taken a very hard line that said, we can't trust anything in the UK. It's a, it's a 
a third country, um, no basis for trust, might as well be, you know, some famously awful country um, like New Zealand. Well, I'll let me be fair, or Australia. Um, whether or not you can get away with that from either under the TCA, interestingly, because there is all this proportionality language there, or more importantly, under the WTO, which actually talks about this as well, is a question that we need to come to. Finally, and very quickly, um, trade remedies. Well, trade remedies are to protect you from either unfair practices um, in an exporting country, and the unfair practices are of two types, companies that sell to you uh, below cost simplifying, right? So like predatory pricing in uh, competition. This is a, a big oversimplification, by the way, as anyone who knows this will, will know, but that gives you an understanding of what's going on for those who don't. And secondly, subsidization by governments, which is uh, uh, Kenneth is going to talk about a little bit more and how it's addressed at a more systemic level. Um, and then another uh, uh, problem that can arise is when you haven't anticipated lots and lots of products coming in, uh, which destroy or badly damage your domestic industry. Now, in all of these cases, you're entitled to impose under normal trade rules, uh, trade remedies or procedures. You need to show various things. Um, now, interestingly, the TCA allows for all of this. Normal trade remedies apply um, now to EU products. So dumped products by EU companies, subsidized products from the EU and unexpected surges in imports from the EU uh, can all be hit by the UK by imposing additional duties uh, on these products and vice versa. One final point I'm going to hand over um, uh, is how does this all connect with Northern Ireland? Again, Ken's going to talk about Northern Ireland, but I would just say one thing on this final point, which is that both the EU and the UK claim to be able to impose their trade remedies on products going into Northern Ireland. The EU on the uh, basis that um, I imagine these products are at risk of ending up in the EU market, so you want to hit them uh, at the um, GB NI border or the rest of the world NI border and the UK on the basis that, as the protocol says, Northern Ireland is within the customs union of uh, the United Kingdom. That is an interesting um, overlap of <clears throat> regimes, which um, presumably the joint uh, committee uh, under the protocol is now um, thinking about how to sort out. With that, I will stop and hand over to Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura and uh, Catherine. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. yes. Okay, so um, I want, thank you very much. I want to talk very briefly about institutions, dispute settlement and services all in about seven or eight minutes. So it's going to be a whistle stop tour. I want to just start with governance and specifically the structure of the treaty. Um, as you know, uh, important to note, there is essentially one main treaty. There are two separate ones on very specific topics, but for our purposes, there's one main treaty with overarching um, institutional and dispute resolution provisions. And then there are, it's essentially subdivided into the pillars that I have um, outlined of which the FDA pillar is clearly the largest and the one that we shall be talking about mainly today, but don't forget the rather generous um, and slightly un unexpected detailed um, law enforcement pillar that John Spencer will be talking mm -hmm. about. And um, the really important and significant um, annexes. One other point to note, I think, is the emphasis on the number of additional um, agreements that may well be entered into. And indeed, any future agreement will be subject to this same institutional structure. Um, and that's important because unlike Switzerland, uh, Switzerland, um, of course, has 120 or so uh, bilateral agreements. And what the EU wanted is a structure rather like the one that you find in the TCA. A couple of points to note. First of all, um, that uh, there are common institutional provisions, but in that there is a strong emphasis on the fact that this is an agreement under international law, not under EU law. 
and it will be interpreted in accordance with customary international law, including the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and it's absolutely clear that there is no direct effect. Uh, second point is that the um, implementation of the TCA is to be reviewed every five years, together with the review in Northern Ireland um, after four years on the continuing consent. It makes me concerned that this is a rather unstable deal because uh, depending on the politics, um, this deal can be challenged um, in the run up to the next um, Westminster elections. Um, second point is about governance structure. This slide, um, I have, I agree, um, oversimplified the governance structure, but in essence, what you have is the partnership council at the top, which is the political body, which may have input from um, the assembly of um, parliament, both um, UK, question mark, what about the devolves and um, the European parliament. And yet a lot of the work will be done by technical committees, um, in particular, the trade partnership committee, but there are a bunch of other specialized committees and working groups with that, which Anton Spisak very helpfully has pulled together on this slide. I don't want to go through the committees, but just to give you a flavor of the complex um, institutional underbelly of uh, this agreement. Um, the Partnership Council has a lot of power. Um, it can make legally binding decisions and not legally binding recommendations, including to amend the treaty itself in certain places. As far as dispute resolution is concerned, um, at one level, it looks straightforward because you have got one big dispute resolution mechanism, which maps to an extent onto what you find in the WTO. In fact, the more you read the treaty, the more you see that there are many dispute resolution mechanisms, um, some of which seem to expressly disapply the general dispute resolution mechanism. But in fact, although they say they disapply the dispute resolution mechanism, you see that they um, log back into parts of the dispute resolution mechanism. And a good example of that is in respect of um, the level playing field rules in respect of social matters and environmental matters, and also the rebalancing provisions. But if we just focus on the main dispute resolution mechanism, um, essentially, there are four questions or four stages. Stage one, you've got to work out whether the dispute falls within the scope. And that scope issue is important um, because it also impacts in respect of the compliance. Then you go to a more political stage, consultations, um, trying to sort out uh, the problem and hopefully it can be resolved at this stage. If not, it goes to arbitration. Um, three arbitrators with expertise in um, uh, domestic law and international law, not EU law, as is the case under the withdrawal agreement. Um, and they then draft an interim report, which um, either side can comment on, and then they can make a final report in up to 160 days after the start of the process. So a relatively speedy process. Note, there is, unlike under the WTO, there's no provision for an appeal against the decision of the arbitration um, panel. Um, and then you go into compliance. Now, the um, defaulting state has got to comply within um, a reasonable period or offer suitable um, agreed compensation. If that's not possible, um, then you go into what are, I think, rather misleadingly called temporary remedies, um, which allows for proportionate cross retaliation across all economic sectors, which means essentially um, putting um, tariffs on goods. And of course, the EU is extremely good at working out what are the most sensitive sectors on which to put tariffs. And so prime examples would be things like Scottish salmon, Scottish whiskey, and of course, that um, in itself raises issues um, internally within the UK in respect of uh, devolution. So that's what I want to say by way of uh, introduction just to the governance and the dispute resolution. 
The final thing I was asked to talk about was to say something about services. Now services is fiendishly complicated, but what I thought I would focus on is the movement of natural persons, which is the area that's actually attracting the attention at the moment because of um, musicians. And you'll know that musicians are very concerned that they have lost free movement rights. Are they right to be concerned? Yes, they are because um, under the provisions in the um, services chapters on the, um, in the TCA, in fact, movement for uh, natural persons is extremely limited. For those of you who know your GATS, there are four modes. Um, mode one is cross-border supply, so where I supply a service from the UK into France. Mode two is um, where I travel to France to receive a service such as tourism. Mode one and mode two um, are dealt with together in the TCA in chapter three. And it's worth bearing in mind that in respect of particularly mode one, which is the big issue, um, there are 200 pages of reservations. So despite the commitments that are made in the main part of the treaty, the devil really is in the detail. In respect of mode two, where I travel to France to receive a service, including tourism, um, I have, um, there is the possibility of being there for 90 days out of 180 days. Not great for those who want to get some, summer, some uh, winter sun in Spain, because they can only go for three months um, uh, and then they've got to come back for a period of time, I, um, another three months before they can go to Spain again. So this is not what they had before. Mode three commercial presence is about mainly legal persons establishing themselves. And that, that's of course not relevant to musicians or to any other natural person. But what there is, is a chapter, chapter four, on the presence of natural persons. And this bit is complicated. But in essence, what chapter four does is to allow, as do a number of free trade agreements, the possibility for people to travel as ICTs, uh, intracorporate transferees, um, business visitors for establishment purposes, contract service suppliers, um, independent um, professional uh, providers of services, and short-term business visitors. Now, this is where it gets really messy, but in headline terms, um, the, you are allowed to travel if you fall into various quite tightly defined categories and you can get yourselves into one of these headings. Um, and then the TCA lays down the period of time that you can stay and whether it is visa or work permit free of which only um, business visitors, BVEs and STVVs um, are visa or permit free. Um, and then the question is, can you get paid when you go to provide those services? Um, and if we focus on the short term business visitors, which is the more generous category that the government is proud of having included in the treaty, um, there are a bunch of things that you can do. So I can go to France to do some research or to attend a training seminar. Um, but what I can't do is get paid by um, anyone in France, which is where your musicians come a cropper because it's unlikely that they will fall into any of the other categories. And even though they can go and um, play music for free, even though even that's maybe not clear, um, because musicians just can't, aren't covered in the STBV list. The bottom line is that um, whatever Boris Johnson said in, to the liaison committee yesterday, that musicians should have nothing to worry about, I'm afraid that is fundamentally untrue. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, we go straight to Professor Armstrong. Kenneth. Thanks very much, Marcus. Um, so my comments today are focused on the level playing field obligations, which are contained in the, the TCA. And I go into some more detail in a blog that I posted uh, this morning on my brexittime.com blog. Uh, and my remarks are, are, are more or less based on, on that blog post. Now, it's clear that the inclusion of a title in the agreement uh, creating level playing field obliga obligations 
proved very controversial and disagreements could have, have derailed the negotiations. Now we can look at this from a political angle and also from a, from a legal angle. The political angle is that the UK clearly didn't want a trading relationship with the EU based on continuing compliance with EU rules. Leaving the single market was about just that. If Brexit meant anything, it had to mean autonomy over its laws, including a freedom to diverge from EU rules. For the EU, it also wanted to protect its autonomy and wasn't willing to grant tariff-free access uh, to its markets, only to face potentially unfair competition from the UK in terms of the UK's approach to subsidies, uh, application of competition rule and tax rules, and any diminution on labour and environmental standards. So in their joint political declaration, both sides had committed to the inclusion of robust commitments on a level playing field for open and fair competition. However, their initial draft agreements published in early 2020 showed a chasm in their political expectations. The UK cut and pasted a set of thin exhortations from the EU-Canada uh, trade agreement with WTO norms, WTO norms and international standards as the base reference points. The EU envis envisaged a significant level of compliance with EU rules, non-regression commitments, including mechanisms for increasing protection through amendments to the agreements be made by the, by the Partnership, Partnership Council or through various ratchet mechanisms. Now, the resulting Title 11 of Part 1 of the agreement is an inevitable compromise. Textually, it is based on the EU draft, but significant changes have been made to reflect the UK's uh, demands for, for greater autonomy. Now, from a legal perspective, what is interesting is just how uneven the level playing field is when one looks across the areas of subsidy control, competition and tax policies, and labour and environmental standards. That unevenness relates to the, the, the sources of the underlying norms that establish commitments, as well as the enforcement and dispute resolution mechanisms. Now, thinking first about the sources of norms, clearly the UK was unwilling to remain directly bound by EU rules, although it had already conceded that, that uh, uh, compliance with EU rules would form part of the, the Northern Ireland uh, protocol attached to, to the withdrawal agreement. Attempts by the EU to commit the UK to direct compliance with an annexed list of state aid rules uh, was repelled. And instead it's the agreement itself, which is the direct source of the commitments on subsidy control. Although as George Perrett's QC ha has noted, these provisions themselves mirror EU state aid rules. Conversely, uh, whereas the EU had originally wanted the agreement to contain substantive competition law provisions, the agreement instead commits both parties to following their respective competition law regimes. In respect to taxation matters, both sides had a relatively similar starting point in tethering their commitments to international standards, including OECD provisions on base erosion and profit sharing. Uh, however, the EU also wanted the UK to commit to the code of conduct on business taxation uh, agreed by EU ministers back in 1997, but this was not accepted by the UK. Now, tethering both the EU and the UK to commitments under international rules and standards is a way of minimizing divergence between both parties and avoiding unilateral defections from common rules. However, it may establish a relatively minimal baseline of protection. And unsurprisingly, the EU sought to bind the UK more closely to the common standards of both the EU and the UK at the end of, of the transition period. In tax matters, the EU sought to pin the UK to common tax avoidance measures, but without success. And instead, there are specific non-regression commitments in respect of OECD instruments and certain common rules, but not including tax avoidance measures. Provisions that uh, would have given the Partnership Council powers to amend the agreement and increase standards uh, didn't make it into, into the, the final agreement. Now, in labour and environmental standards, whereas the UK saw, saw non-regression in terms of the type of broad exhortations copy and pasted from, from CETA, the EU was more specific in seeking to 
benchmark non-regression against common EU rules as at the end of the transition period. And in seeking improvement to standards over time and then ratcheting the benchmark for non-regression against this rising floor of standards. Now, the ratchet provision never made it into the final agreement, but the UK did accept the basic principle of non-regression based on the positions at the end of the transition period and agreed to strive to improve standards. International agreements are, however, still of relevance to alignment of the EU and the UK in both labour and environmental standards. Enforcement of commitments also varies across policy areas. It's particularly noteworthy that in the subsidy control and competition fields, both parties commit to maintaining operationally independent and impartial enforcement authorities. And I think what is striking about that is how that actually might have impact on the European Commission as both a political executive, but also a state aid and competition law enforcement agency. In terms of labour law, the emphasis is more on ensuring that domestic administrative and judicial bodies are capable of enforcing domestic laws, including ensuring effective remedies. But this is very much a matter within the autonomy of the respective uh, parties and their legal systems. Finally, as for dispute resolution, as Catherine ha ha has underlined, part six of the agreement sets out dispute resolution mechanisms and in addition, Chapter 9 of Title 11 of Part 1 uh, creates horizontal provisions uh, applicable specifically to these level playing field obligations. But for competition and tax matters, Part 6 isn't applicable. It is applicable to subsidy control, but not in respect of individual subsidies. Again, underlying the point that Catherine made about the differential application of the dispute resolution mechanisms. For labour and environmental standards, including disputes over the non-regression principles, the horizontal provisions in Chapter 9 exclusively apply, requiring disputes to be resolved by uh, expert panels to be created. The most challenging aspect of the horizontal provisions are the rebalancing measures which may be taken if the par parties consider that divergence has a material impact on trade and investment. Now, the TCA lacks clarity as to what these rebalancing measures uh, might be, but they are to be specific, time limited, strictly necessary and proportionate. Action may be taken relatively swiftly uh, if it should prove that recourse to, to these measures uh, and uh, if recourse to these measures uh, proves to be frequent, there is a review mechanism built into the agreement which would allow the entire part one uh, of the agreement on goods to, to, to be uh, considered. So to conclude, from a legal perspective, the level playing field obligations are uneven across the different policy areas falling within its scope. In part, these reflect different political positions, but they also reflect what was always the heterogeneous nature of EU policies across these different sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Armstrong. Um, I should remind the audience that, uh, that you should please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will have the Q&A at the very end. So please post your questions to the panelists in the Q&A function. And um, I'd like to hand over to uh, uh, Lauren Bartels, please. Right, so it's now my uh, pleasure to introduce panel number two, which is on some specific elements of the TCA. Um, everybody that I will refer to is at Cambridge in one capacity or other, uh, although in the case of Professor John Spencer, he was at Cambridge, is now emeritus professor, so in that sense, he's still at Cambridge. So we have Dr. Martin Steinfeld, who will talk about human rights law. Uh, Dr. Marcus Gehring, whom you have just seen, who will talk about the environment and climate change. Dr. David Erdos, who will talk about data protection. And Professor Spencer, who will talk about criminal law cooperation. So let me now hand over first to Martin. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. Thank you, Dr. Bartles. Um, I feel very much like um, I know Dr. Gehring doesn't want me to refer to food analogies, so the closest I'll get is to say that I'm, I'm either the uh, amuse-bouche or aperitif for um, much, uh, much more interesting colleagues um, to come. Um, I'm particularly interested to hear from them. Um, but I would like to just outline briefly, I suppose, my perspective um, on the new world that we're in with the TCA and human rights. Um, I suppose with um, free movement um, of persons now gone with of course of the, with the exception of natural persons and the way um, that Professor Barnard has outlined, how relevant is, is human rights in the TCA now? Um, well, it's still considered to be important um, under the TCA because it's mentioned immediately in the preamble to the TCA. The, the preamble refers to the fact that both parties um, reaffirm their commitment to democratic principles, to the rule of law, to human rights, and of course, to other matters such as in relation to the fight against climate change. So what I'd like to do in this very brief presentation is to ask perhaps a what if question. What if the United Kingdom decided that it wanted to quit the European Convention on Human Rights or repeal the Human Rights Act, just to illustrate perhaps how this would flow into the TCA. Um, so the reason why I've asked this question is to see how the, the TCA is similar or is different from um, other um, agreements with third countries with the European Union and how um, they uh, in, um, implement human rights norms within the frameworks of those of those texts. So to give um, one example I'm going to, to bring up is the Cotonou Agreement um, with the ACP countries. Um, so there is no regime for, for free movement anymore. We're in this world where the Charter isn't to a certain extent applicable. Um, but there are some key parts of the TCA where um, the issue of human rights is still highly relevant. Um, whilst um, it was inserted right at the start on the original draft of the TCA back in May of last year, um, it's now been negotiated to form, uh, to be buried 418 pages into the agreement under what is now Article Comprov 4. And in, uh, under Article Comprov 4, um, both sides commit to uphold um, uh, shared values, which includes respect for human rights. At this point, the European Convention, UN equivalent, but is mentioned, but the U European Convention is not mentioned um, as one of those human rights instruments that are shared. It is then defined as an essential element under Comprov 12 of um, that same part of the agreement. And the, the, the implications of that is that under Art Inst 35, I, I'm not sure whether my, the previous panelists have referred to these horribly phrased um, uh, articles yet, but we're, we're in, this, in, in, we're in this world now. But under Art Inst 35, a failure to fulfill those obligations um, uh, described as essential elements um, in a serious and substantial sense could then lead to termination of the agreement. However, it's unlikely that this would happen, even if in the case of the UK um, either repealing the Human Rights Act or quitting the Convention altogether. Why do I say that? Well, firstly, there's a procedure that has to be followed at the Partnership Council under Article 2 of, uh, sorry, under subsection 2 of Article 35. Um, and perhaps more importantly, both parties, including the EU, would have to act in a way that it fully respects um, international law and is proportionate. Um, perhaps even more um, important is um, subsection four of Art Inst 35, which states that um, suspension of the agreement would only take place if um, the behaviour by, in this case, the UK, is of a, such a gravity in nature and would be of such an exceptional sort that it would threaten peace or security or have international repercussions. Well, if you think about it, the UK repealing the Human Rights Act would simply put the United Kingdom in a position that it was prior to 1998, where it had already been a member state, for instance, of the European Union for 30 years. So in my view, at least, it would be hard to argue 
that um, subsection four could, could apply here, or the whole of art inst 35. Um, also, even if it quit the European Convention altogether, um, now this is not me being a spokesperson for the Conservative Party, for those that know me that would never happen, um, but it's, um, it, the, to be fair, David Cameron in 2010 did make the pledge that even if this happens, there wouldn't be some void um, of, of human rights protection within the United Kingdom, a domestic bill of rights would be installed instead. If we tie that in with the development of common law constitutionalism, um, we are in a world where it would be hard to say that the UK is behaving in a way that is of such a gravity in nature to justify invoking these provisions. Um, but it could be used as a threat. Contrast this with um, the situation under Article 7 of the TEU and Poland. Now, I wish I had more time. Professor Barnard referred to this as well. We wish we had more time. But essentially, one of the reasons I wanted to bring up the EU equivalent is what to compare and contrast, which essentially is better or worse. On one level, um, a member state stands to lose a huge amount by contrast with the situation of the UK if it's deprived of voting rights in the council under Article 7. That being said, unanimity is required, which is why Poland and Hungary have not actually had any measures taken against them. Um, and on one level, it is, um, um, despite the fact that actually proving Article 35.4 is, is serious, um, the UK's procedure in one level is, is much simpler. All the EU needs to do is to invoke it. So um, I certainly don't think it's as simple as suggesting that the United Kingdom um, is not perhaps going to think of the implications if it decided to do this. This then gets even more serious um, if you look at the implications on the um, police and judicial cooperation and criminal matters aspects under the TCA, which is in part three. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this because Professor Spencer, I have no doubt, will refer to this. But... Um, under Article, um, uh, Article, that, well, there are pretty broad powers and under Part 3 in general. This includes things that are important to the United Kingdom on data sharing, so I'm not going to eat into, into Dr. Erdos's um, uh, time as well, uh, terrorist financing, and of course, the European, well, the, the, the arrest warrant. Um, but Article 3, Gen 3 of Part 3 makes it clear that, that the UK needs to exercise its powers under here and the EU uh, in accordance with human rights. And this time the European Convention is mentioned. And the entire process here presupposes convention membership by the UK. And if it quit, there would be big consequences because Art Law Other 136 of Part 3 makes it clear that if the UK denounces, quote unquote, the convention, then Part 3 after nine months would cease to apply altogether. Um, I would like to end just quickly by referring perhaps to other international agreements. I like the Cotonou Agreement because it appears to contain um, similar elements to what's in um, the TCA. There is an essential element aspect of it in Article 9 of the Cotonou Agreement. Human rights is considered to be important under the Cotonou Agreement, and it is possible for the agreement to be suspended in whole or in part if there'd been an agrarian human rights breach by some of the ACP countries and, of course, the EU member states as well. Um, however, if you look at the agreement, it looks very much like what I would call a persuasive or soft norms approach rather than the type of approach that is taken. And this is because the TCA is an entirely different type of agreement from these other types of agreements for which human rights are mentioned, because for the UK, criminal cooperation and data sharing is extremely important to it, amongst other things. Um, I think that's all I have to say on that point, and I'm very much looking forward to the other panellists. And thank you, Dr Bartles, for chairing. Thank you very much. Now, um, let me move straight on to uh, Marcus. Thank you very much, Laurent. Um... Yes, so um, uh, unlike in, in uh, many other areas of uh, this less free trade agreement, uh, there are actually very important innovations um, uh, for, for a trade agreement in the field of environmental protection and climate change. Uh, 
um, we could say that uh, these are not as innovative as maybe some of the association agreement uh, provisions for countries that wish to join the European Union, but for a straight up uh, free trade agreement, these are truly revolutionary. And I'd like to highlight uh, just a few. Um, I was quite surprised by the final agreement uh, because it uh, is in keeping with the very high ambition that the uh, European Union had for climate change. While the UK draft didn't contain any specific uh, obligations on climate change because uh, the EU wanted uh, a standalone energy agreement in which to integrate them. Uh, the political declaration didn't actually commit uh, to uh, a very um, high level of climate ambition, uh, just mandated uh, negotiations and discussions about climate change. Now, the preamble um, is uh, already quite innovative after a standard preamble that we find in many EU free trade agreement. There is of course the level playing field uh, part of the preamble, uh, which also highlights climate change and environment protection as uh, part of these level playing field provisions. And then as uh, Dr. Steinfeld just uh, reported, we have the material breach um, provisions at the very end under COMFRO 5, we see that the fight against climate change is uh, one of those uh, provisions that form the basis of the cooperation along with democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction to name just a few. It's an essential element of the partnership established by the TCA in any supplementing agreement. So it's not something that the parties could just uh, set aside if they so decide. Uh, the formulation is copied from the EU draft with the only slight change that uh, man-made climate change was uh, changed into a more gender neutral human caused climate change. The language is one of the strongest that we find in any trade agreement, declaring that climate change represents an ex existential threat to humanity and that each party shall respect the Paris Agreement and the process set up by the UNFCCC and refrain from acts or emissions that would materially defeat the object and purpose of the Paris Agreement. Under Title 11, we have the level playing field provisions. And then in Chapter 7, we have uh, environment and climate change provisions, which set out the details of what is actually the commitment. And there we see the level of uh, environmental protection being defined as many areas over which uh, the EU has competence, but for example, omitting soil protection because soil protection is largely in the competence of the member states. But the level of climate, uh, the climate level of protection is defined by the previous 2030 targets of 40% reduction uh, by 2030 for the entire EU. And that would um, uh, equate to a 37% reduction uh, by 2030 based on 2005 levels. Now, of course, in December, both the EU and the UK announced much more ambitious 2030 targets, 55% for the EU and 68% of reduction for the UK under 1990 levels, uh, but these uh, were presumably negotiated before those concrete reduction commitments were made. Uh, we find very strict, uh, as, as previous speakers have alluded to, very strict non-regression provisions uh, containing mandatory language. Um, and there is some discussion in, uh, among environmental groups about this term that was introduced by the UK in a manner affecting trade and investment in Article 7.2.2. Um, in my view, if we use WTO interpretation of uh, affecting trade or investment, that just means it needs to have an economic impact. Um, but uh, I don't think it, it, um, it means any kind of elevated 
level of proof uh, uh, how concretely um, these changes could affect um, international trade. And then, of course, um, I, I think Professor Armstrong mentioned uh, the, the significant provision uh, called rebalancing, uh, so the ratcheting up provisions in Article 9.4, which means if there are significant divergence between the parties in a field like environment or climate change, then there could be balancing, um, limited balancing um, uh, measures adopted. Of course, material impacts on trade and investment arise as a result of significant divergences are two very high uh, levels um, that, needs, that need to be met uh, in order to adopt those balancing measures. But nonetheless, uh, especially with regards to climate change, uh, we could see those uh, uh, thresholds being met. Chapter eight contains the environment and sustainable development provisions. And here, this is largely based on the EU draft, whereby the parties agreed to um, uh, basically water down the language uh, using less mandatory language. Uh, so in, instead of promote trade in products derived from the sustainable use of biological resources, it now says encourage uh, trade in products derived from a sustainable use of natural resources. Uh, so fewer commitments uh, based from, from the basis of the EU draft, but nonetheless, very ambitious language with regards to um, climate change, biodiversity, and even forestry protection where uh, future generations um, are mentioned. Now, uh, environmental principles uh, from the EU are not directly contained in the agreement. Instead, the parties opted for international principles, but then uh, proceeded to list uh, basically the established principles that can be found in the Rio Declaration, but also in uh, the TFEU in Article 191. So to conclude, I think with regards to the climate change and environment provisions, this is the most ambitious uh, free trade agreement that um, I've seen. I hope that it could provide a blueprint for future free trade agreements, either by the UK or indeed the European Union. And uh, we all know that, for example, the Mercosur agreement is still in the legal scrubbing process. So maybe some of the ambition on uh, environment and climate change could be copied into those agreements. Thank you very much, Laurent. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's move straight on to David on data protection. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, and um, it's great to be part of this event and, and thank you especially to, to Marcus for all his work on it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about personal data and uh, the Brexit agreement. And I think this is really a story of two halves um, which need to be in some sense synthesized um, as well. So the first half, and in a way what's, what's uh, the most material in the agreement, relates to the exchange of personal data for broadly criminal justice purposes. I mean, it's known um, within the EU context as the area of freedom, justice and security, nice kind of lovely words uh, for essentially criminal justice. And the outcome here is that there is quite extensive provision for the exchange of uh, personal data. So um, so-called PRUM data from the PRUM agreement, which is DNA, fingerprint uh, and vehicle registration data, uh, passenger name record data for flights, criminal records, and more diffuse exchange, including in the context of cooperation with Europol and uh, Eurojust. Now that is in a sense indirect through um, national contact points, but there is the emphasis on ensuring 24 seven um, access. And so I think that that is really significant uh, data sharing. The loss is um, of the Schengen Information System, 
and access to Eurodac, which is a fingerprint database itself, although there are some limited provisions on missing persons and objects. However, I think that is probably more of a consequence of the loss of free movement than anything to do with um, data protection uh, in and of itself. Okay, so all of this is subject to very extensive data protection safeguards, and I won't go through them all, but accuracy, necessity, time limitation, things on encryption, and data breaches, data protection oversight by, by a regulator, and even an evaluation to a visit in the case of PRUM data. But all of those provisions are targeted on the information actually being transferred in these quite specialist uh, provisions, not on the wider ecosystem. And that is in a way the second half, which is what is the framework for that wider ecosystem of data protection and free flow? Well, in the interim period, we're not a third country, evidently. The agreement establishes that as long as we don't make any significant legal amendment to our law, which obviously is broadly similar to EU law, then in an interim period we will essentially be treated as part of the economic area or European economic area. And that's subject to us granting the EU adequacy, data adequacy. That comes to an end, though, within six months. It's four months and extendable for two and whenever adequacy is uh, obtained. Other clauses particularly emphasize the independent right to regulate data protection, along with a whole load of other things like consumer protection, many things in the environment, cultural diversity. And the only exception there is the, again, rather specialist area of direct marketing. So mutual adequacy is clearly the goal. And yes, the Court of Justice post Schrems has talked about mutual adequacy as essential equivalence with the EU arrangements. But we know that countries with very different data protection frameworks like uh, New Zealand, which has been mentioned, uh, and also Israel, have somehow attained this status. And so it seems uh, achievable for the UK. But adequacy is not the same as no barriers to the free flow of personal data. It's not necessarily stable, as the US has found out. Uh, they are potentially transparency and documentation requirements. And of course, if companies uh, and other controllers are targeting the EU market, for example, offering goods and services, then they will now have the obligation to follow local law and local regulation. So, what is the stock take of all of this then, bringing them both together? Well, assuming that adequacy is obtained, we will have the closest possible personal data relationship with the EU outside the EEA and Switzerland. But that relationship is not all that close. Talks under um, or suggestions under Theresa May and from some elements of big business that there would be some kind of formal arrangement for institutional regulatory cooperation have not been obtained. And the analogy with Switzerland shouldn't be taken too far. Now, that isn't primarily an issue of institutions. Switzerland does have limited regulatory cooperation in the context of Schengen and Eurodac. But it doesn't, for example, have any PNR, a passenger name record agreement with the EU. It's more a matter of normative commitment. Switzerland is very much within the EU norm and actually at the stringent end of the EU norm on data protection. That's actually why there is no PNR agreement, I think, because Switzerland doesn't require that data in its own internal law out of privacy concerns. The UK, on the other hand, has always been rather sceptical about the EU's approach to data protection, about public surveillance, about the idea, as Michael Gove said, that EU law hobbles the internet companies and their development um, with a very pragmatic regulator. So we're likely to see potential change, use of that independent right to regulate, and a more distant and potentially fractious relationship with the EU here than, say, Switzerland. 
as long as that's in the context of mutual adequacy, and one other thing which I haven't mentioned, but is the Data Protection Convention at the Council of Europe and bona fide a good implementation of that convention, then I think that there is still the possibility of moving forward in a positive way on data protection, uh, even with Brexit. Thank you. Right. Um, okay, thank you very much, David. And now, uh, quickly, let me move to John Spencer to talk about uh, justice cooperation. Well, while the newspapers were full of red lines and uh, fishermen being thrown under buses and quotas or not quotas, nobody heard anything about negotiations on future criminal justice cooperation to the point where uh, most of us who were interested in this field gloomily assumed the existing arrangements would just end on the 1st of January and we'd be in a relationship with the EU just like any other third country is with the EU. Not so at all, quietly in the background and without fuss and seemingly with a lot of agreement and astonishing speed a large packet of measures was agreed, which are in Title III of the treaty. And a lot of it goes further than we thought would actually happen. Um, I think there was a strong community of interest between the UK and the EU, and little feeling that the EU should be made to give something back in return. Both sides thought it was win-win to keep as much as much as it was as possible. So what have we got? Well, here's something we haven't got. Part of EU criminal law is the law relating to some institutions, Europol and Eurojust, collegiate bodies, which exist to share information and to coordinate the activities um, no powers to make orders for what the different authorities in the member states can do, but powers to coordinate and help them. Europol for police, um, Eurojust for public prosecutors. We dropped out of that on the 1st of January 20, and we aren't back into it. However, both those bodies have provision for relationships with third countries who can have a little desk over in the corner. They can't help run it, but they can share some of the facilities. The UK has that kind of arrangement. I think it would have had it even without a treaty and our status as a second class citizen is solemnly reaffirmed in the agreement. So we don't help run it anymore. What formerly we fielded a director of Europol and two presidents of Eurojust, but to quote the phrase which the Brexiteers used, put it backwards, the EU has taken back control of both of those institutions. Secondly, EU criminal law consisted of a lot of police cooperation measures in particular in the sharing of information, and previous speakers have already told us quite a lot about those. And we've managed to stay inside nearly all of that, with the one important exception that Martin Steinfeld mentioned, the, or was it David Erdos or both of you, the Schengen information system, and the UK would have liked to stay in that, but the EU wasn't having it. That is important because it's a system for flashing information about crimes automatically around the EU. And it is the mechanism by which EU member states announce the issue of European arrest warrants. When a state issues in the European arrest warrant, zap, out it goes to all the 27 member states. And when you read Brexiteers complaining about how the UK was overwhelmed by 2000 European arrest warrants attempts whereas we only got 150 people back or something, 
It was all misleading because what they were talking about were the signals on the Schengen system of the issue of European arrest warrants. They weren't things directed particularly to the UK. Um, and it's a puzzle as to know how our new European arrest warrant light, which I'll talk about in a minute, is going to be signaled around the EU when we're not part of the Schengen information system. Some kind of workaround, no doubt, will be devised, but it is something of a loss, is the Schengen information system. Then moving on quickly, the EU criminal justice provisions included a number of mutual recognition instruments by which the member courts of other member states would automatically recognize or almost automatically recognize um, decisions made by courts of fellow member states. Replacing a kind of mutual assistance regime under which one member state or one country would have to go to another and say, please, could you possibly, as a great favor to us in your time, and if you've got nothing better to do, help us by doing this, a system under which you issue orders. Mark, Mark, and get on with it. You know, arrest him, search for this, or whatever. Headed in the list here, of course, was the European arrest warrant. A major enemy in the view of the extreme Tory Brexiteers. And if they had read the treaty, they probably wouldn't like the fact that we've got even an EAW -E light compared with what we had before when they probably wouldn't have wanted to have anything. We have something very recognizably like the European arrest warrant in place of what there was before, but it has a number of respects in which it's weaker. The full list of weaknesses compared with the other is 10, but I'm only just going to mention one, which is a shoe that I think will pinch. It's that other member states that make it a principle not to surrender their nationals will be able to refuse to surrender their, their nationals under the EAW light that is now part of the treaty. Um, the UK traditionally was always prepared to surrender its own nationals. And there's no indication that the UK is going to refuse to surrender its nationals to the EU member states under this arrangement. But we can be pretty sure that a number of member states will henceforth, as they used to pre-European arrest warrant, refuse to surrender their nationals. Um, there are replacement measures for the other mutual, most of the other mutual recognition instruments, including the European uh, um, the EIO, the European Information, I can never remember acronyms under pressure, but the thing that gave automatic recognition to things like search warrants, again, a bit watered down, but quite a lot more than we thought we were going to get. The last thing I will mention in this very brief examination is that the defense lose out. Everything that's kept is basically favorable to prosecutors and nothing that's got passed through is helpful to the defense with one exception that I'll mention in a minute. The EU had various rather feeble directives related to safeguarding the rights of defendants. Um, only some of which the UK had um, opted into. Needless to say, with the present government in charge, um, we didn't want, didn't have any of them stuck in the treaty. What is what could be a particular trouble is the disappearance, as far as I can see, without an equivalent of what was sometimes called the Euro bail directive, the arrangement under which a person who was wanted under a European arrest warrant for trial in another country had the possibility of serving 
his bail in his or her member state instead of having to be exported to the country of trial where very likely he or she would end up in prison pending trial for fear they'd flee. That was potentially something extremely helpful for defendants being prosecuted in other countries, though I don't think it was ever greatly used, and that's disappeared without trace, I regret to say, in the treaty. But what is in there, as Marcus told us, Mark, um, Mark, Martin Steinfeld told us, is that all this part of the agreement <clears throat> is written in such a way that it depends on the UK's continuing within the Strasbourg arrangements with European human, with uh, the Convention on Human Rights. On the far right of the Conservative Party, I think there was a move to try and have Brexit too, which was to get us out of all that apparatus once we were out of the EU. And there was certainly some political support for this. I remember reading a headline in a tabloid newspaper when I was waiting to have my car um, MOT'd at Marshall's, either the Daily Mail or the Sun, and the headline of this, to this commentary actually said, to break the grip of human rights, the UK must leave the EU. And for a lot of populist politicians, it's something else that's the enemy, something else we should get rid of. And David Cameron, before the uh, 2015 election, was even floating the idea that we would repeal the hated Human Rights Act, etc. And some people would read that as and getting out of all of it. But it's plain that um, we can't do that if we want to keep this basically surprisingly favorable uh, criminal justice package. Thank you, everybody. I'll say no more for the moment. Well, thank you very much, uh, John, and everybody else on this panel covering all of these more detailed aspects um, of the TCA, and I should say aspects that have not got as much um, airplay uh, in the uh, Twitter sphere, um, blogs, and so on as uh, some of the aspects that we spoke about in the first panel. So it's great to learn more about this. Let me hand over now uh, to our grand chair, um, Marcus, to take us further. And I hand over to Catherine because she's sharing the panel that looks at the EU future relations bill and the constitutional dimension of the TCA. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the previous speakers. I'd like to turn now to look um, domestic as opposed to European and see how the TCA has manifested itself um, through the EU Future Relationship Bill Now Act. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Alison Young, uh, Professor at uh, Public Law at Cambridge, and Jack Williams, uh, Barrister at Moncton Chambers, and someone who's been very helpful and supportive of the faculty. Um, Alison, over to you. Um, it's actually uh, Jack that's going to start first, so sorry about that. So Jack's going to, sorry, I couldn't get it to unmute, but Jack's going to start okay. first thank for you. us. Okay. Splendid, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to deal with the implementation into domestic law of all that's been spoken about for the past hour or so in about 10 minutes. So I will do my best for that. The EU Relationship Act implements three agreements, the TCA, of course, the nuclear agreement and the security agreement. The act also though provides the conduit pipes for the implementation of other so-called future relationship agreements envisaged by and in those agreements. Now due to the time I shall cover only three topics but I've written a detailed guide on eurelationslaw.com. My first topic is an explanation of the implementation techniques deployed in the act. There are three. First, the Act specifically and expressly implements provisions of the agreements in domestic law by enacting new provisions of domestic law. And we see this, for example, in relation to security, trade and transport matters, where there are detailed provisions on the face of the Act, detailed amendments of other Acts, and also, intriguingly, detailed amendments to secondary legislation, including retained EU law. 
Now I say intriguingly there because here you have primary legislation amending what is, at least in form, secondary legislation. It's usually the other way around, of course. Now it may well mean that those amended provisions of domestic regulations, for example, now have the status of primary legislation and so are immune from challenge on ordinary grounds of judicial review that are usually available vis-a-vis -vis domestic secondary regulations. Or could it be said perhaps that Parliament knew that it was amending secondary legislation and so intended that those could still be challenged in the regulation that was being amended? Interesting questions for us constitutional lawyers and litigators, so you may see my eyes twinkle. The second technique uh, is the provisions of the agreements themselves being given direct applicability in domestic law. Now, for the avoidance of doubt, this is not the same thing, and I don't mean the same thing as the concept of direct effect in EU law. Uh, I, in the blog post, I did call this a, a category of direct effectiveness, but I think it's probably easier to use a different phrase so we don't confuse students and each other. So for VAT and Social Security, for example, you have in sections 22 and 26, the incorporation of two quite lengthy protocols simply by cross-reference, essentially. Uh, and then you then have in section 29, the general implementation of other TCA and SOIA provisions, which make provision for the general implementation in domestic law of all other otherwise unimplemented provisions in those two agreements. And I'll return to that in a minute. The third technique of implementation within the Act is the giving of powers to ministers to produce domestic implementing regulations. Now, there's a long list of those powers within the Act, but most notably and most broadly in Section 31, a very wide power is found in relation to the, agenda, the agreements generally. And I'll return to that momentarily. So that's my first topic, looking at the techniques in the Act. My second topic is to look at section 29 itself. That's the general implementation provision and I've put it on the slide to help speed matters up. It provides that existing domestic law has effect with modifications as are required for the purposes of implementing in domestic law, the TCA or the SOIA. Now this seems to me to require public authorities, private parties, and most extraordinarily the courts to, to, to conduct three exercises in relation to international agreements without any sufficient guidance. So firstly, private parties and the courts have to interpret the relevant provisions of international law. Secondly, they then have to implement those provisions. And thirdly, they then have to modify other domestic law. Now courts don't usually like getting involved in international agreements and understandably so because it involves immeasurable exercises of crystal ball gazing and indeed policy choices at each stage of the analysis. So for example, what is the correct interpretation of the agreements? How should those provisions properly or best be implemented in domestic law? And usually there are lots of different ways of potentially doing so. And then how should domestic law otherwise be altered interpreted or modified? Is this really the courts legislating? And I know Alison will discuss concerns in relation to the separation of powers. Now those problems with the Act and section 29 in particular are exacerbated in circumstances where many of the provisions in the agreements themselves are deliberately vague. Now that was I guess in order to secure consensus between the UK and the EU, although maybe the legal scrubbing will resolve that. But moreover, unlike with the European Communities Act, uh, there is no preliminary reference procedure to assist domestic courts. They really are on their own. But despite saying it is extraordinary, which it very much is, I do want to temper some criticism of the section. I think it's important to bear in mind a couple of things. First, in my experience at least, our friends in the government legal department and parliamentary draftsmen don't often, if indeed ever, intend to be constitutionally controversial or sponsor lawyers like myself and litigation. I think that the shift that we see in the Act from the detailed implementations in some areas to more vague and general ones like this provision is not so much based on a substantive policy choice, but the practical realities. They got the agreement on Christmas Eve, as we all did, and then a few days later, they had to ensure that it was implemented in domestic law. 
So I suspect, but I don't know, that the draftsman had access to the less controversial provisions on traders' licenses, for example, earlier, so they could implement in detailed legislation, and then simply had to ensure that they could do the best of a bad job in the time available for the rest. But more substantively, section 29 is limited in substance. Firstly, we have to bear in mind that the conduit itself is materially limited by the very nature of the agreements provisions that are capable of flowing down it in the first place. This ain't EU law. Many of the provisions in the TCA and the SOIA are inherently limited to the international plane, being concerned with state to state rights and obligations rather than those of and for individuals. Although there are real problems in relation to subsidy uh, control provisions, for example. Secondly, the section only applies to provisions that are not implemented by another method via the Act. So one would hope, constitutionally at least, and indeed imagine that over time, section 29 becomes less and less relevant once other mechanisms such as the Henry VIII clauses are utilized. And thirdly, the section 29 conduit does not itself allow for post ratification modifications to the agreements to flow down it. When you look at the definition of relevant day in section 29, it's limited to the treaty as ratified. So that's a whistle stop tour of section 29 and I know Alison will pick up on a few points. My third topic is section 31, which is the third sort of implementation that I discussed at the outset. Section 31 grants a very wide Henry VIII power to make regulations as are deemed appropriate in order to implement the three agreements and any relevant agreement, and also deals with matters, again broadly put, arising out of or related to the agreements or, again, any relevant agreement. Now that rather begs the question what relevant agreement actually is. Uh, that's defined as including any supplementing agreement or agreement otherwise in get, uh, envisaged by the agreements themselves. So that, if you think about it for a second, includes some rather unknowable and undrafted conundrums of potential supplementary agreements. Parliament here has essentially given the government a blank check to implement unknown supplemental agreements in the future. And lastly, like all good Henry VIII clauses, it can amend acts including the act itself. Now, taking a step back here and bearing in mind my audience of predominantly students and academics, I think it's interesting to discuss a trend here in this act and the other Brexit acts and the act regarding COVID. We call these Henry VIII clauses. Now this origi originates from the statute of proclamations, which is on the slide. That stated that the king for the time being with the advice of his council, may set forth proclamations that seem necessary, but this shall not be prejudicial, shall not be prejudicial to any person's inheritance, offices, liberties, goods, chattels, or lives. So is Henry VIII really the right label for some of these powers that we are seeing in the EU Withdrawal Acts and this future Relationship Act? I have to say that for myself, I've been begun calling some of them at least Charles I powers, as I think that's more appropriate. I've put some potentially distinguishing features on, on the slide in front of you of how to spot a Charles I power. Firstly, it's where the legislation uses the phrase appropriate, not necessary. You'll notice that the statute of proclamations on the previous slide referred to necessary. There's no parliamentary oversight for many of these regulations or scrutiny. Again, is that really similar to the Henry VIII clauses in the statute of proclamations with the advice of his council? Thirdly, I think we've seen in relation to a lot of the retained EU law regulations under the 2018 Act, that they can and indeed do remove a number of liberties. So again, that seems materially different to Henry VIII powers, as we've been calling them. Uh, moreover, their scope is not limited in time. So there's no sunset clause, for example, in this section 31 of the Relationship Act, unlike the Withdrawal Act. Uh, and also the, the sheer volume of them is quite mesmerizing. And so I, I do wonder whether there's an academic paper to be written by somebody uh, really exploring whether Henry VIII is the right power. So to conclude in what was really a very quick canter through the act, there are lots of interesting questions for litigators and courts, 
many of which I haven't been able to touch upon in this quick 10 minutes, but I'm sure questions will arise. As, you, as I said earlier, there is a twinkle in my eye as a litigator, but perhaps not as a constitutional law theorist. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jack. It will certainly keep you in um, beer and Skittles for um, the rest of your working life. Can I turn now to uh, Alison? Thank you, Catherine, and, and thank you also, Jack, for uh, giving such a good overview and also for being prepared to stand in for me today if I wasn't uh, well enough to talk to everybody. Um, I want to build on um, Jack's um, presentation and present sort of four points or four sort of concerns from constitutional lawyers about the EU Future Relationship Act. And this is relating to aspects of the rule of law, aspects of the separation of powers, aspects of democracy, or rather the lack of democratic scrutiny, and also very briefly at the end, a few concerns about um, devolution and where this leads the state of the union going forward. So with regards to the rule of law, my main concern is, as you've probably gathered from Jack's presentation, difficulties with the lack of legal certainty and predictability of some of these provisions. And we can see this in particular from sections 31 to 33, the main delegated powers to go away and implement uh, these agreements and section 29, the kind of catch-all provision for when we haven't got round to implementing it yet, but we want to make sure it's still able to be implemented in practice. And my main concerns with the delegated powers is not just that they're such broad provisions, but it leads to all sorts of issues of legal certainty, because often these are enacted quite quickly. They're often put on statutory instrument websites quite quickly, but they're also often in the form of, we're going to overturn this provision or that provision or take away a particular word here. And while lawyers are quite used to going away and scrutinizing aspects and having a whole array of agreements in front of them, that isn't necessarily the case for normal and um, non-legally nerds, I guess is the best way of putting us, um, who have to go and implement these on a day-to-day -day basis. It can be very, very difficult if you're trying to work out what rules are going to apply to you. If you have to go away and start chasing lots and lots of delegated legislation, other bits of delegated legislation, primary legislation and other provisions. So this could make it very, very difficult in terms of legal certainty of individuals who are going to be affected by these particular provisions. With regard to section 29, uh, my concern of legal certainty are escalated mostly because it's very, very difficult to know precisely what section 29 actually means. So we know, first off, we have to think about who is this addressed to? And it just mentions the idea that the law should be given effect sub, uh, with regard to these particular modifications to bring it in line with the agreements. But that can mean we have private individuals trying to work out how to give it effect. It can mean we have frontline administrators, national authorities, and eventually courts facing litigation to work out what modifications are required in these particular circumstances. It's also quite difficult to work out precisely what you're required to do under section 29. So it doesn't look like a standard kind of aspect of an interpretation provision. And the reason it doesn't look like an interpretation provision is because we have no reference to things like read. We just have this idea of them having effect. We have this element also of modifications. So there is the ability not just of reading and trying to interpret, but of making changes and modifications to particular provisions to bring them in line with the treaty provisions. But it also doesn't seem to have the same kind of strength as we see with regard to the old form of direct effect and the primacy of directly effective provisions that we saw under EU law. There's no element of taking effect subject to, and in fact, this is a kind of catch-all default provision where section 29 takes effect subject to all the elements of delegated legislation, for example, that have implemented these particular provisions. So you have this kind of odd element of, it's probably not meant to be disapplying, it can allow you to have changes, and this could give rise to all sorts of problems of trying to understand what the agreement is, whether it's relevant to make a change because there may or may not be delegated legislation that's implemented it. Then you have to work out what you think the modification might be, and this might to all sorts of aspects of a lack of certainty to work out what is actually going on. Now, I understand why I, I'm saying uh, with regards to uh, Jack's comments that these is 
in a sense necessary given the circumstances we find ourselves in and the hope is that more regulations will be enacted and certainty will be established over time but it does mean there is going to be quite a rocky road and this element transition as we try and work out as we move forward what these provisions mean and how they're going to be implemented. This also leads me to my second concern about the separation of powers, because there are distinct elements of lawmaking powers coming through here. So again, with regard to section 29, this isn't just an idea of reading or giving effect, you're allowing people to make modifications. And these could be made by frontline administrators with or without guidance from higher up as to what these modifications may or may not be. And they can also be made by courts. And because we're looking at domestic law here, it could be that courts feel that they're going to be required not just to modify uh, primary and delegated legislation, but the common law in order to make sure it takes effect subject to this agreement. Now, again, this might not necessarily be a very wide application because of the terms and content of the agreement, a lot of which won't have an impact of individual rights. But there's still concerns with regard to this transfer almost of lawmaking powers and a temporary provision without any kind of aspects of safeguards or certainty as to how those lawmaking powers will be implemented. And that brings us also with regard to separation of powers issues to these Henry VIII, or as, as Jack wants to call them, Charles I uh, provisions. Again, they're incredibly broad. There's a constant use of this idea of bringing in measures when it is appropriate, not when it's necessary, a very broadly worded provisions. There are, the la my last count, there are six Henry VIII clauses within um, the Future Relations Act, in addition to these three general provisions. So you have huge aspects of individuals being delegated, le using delegated legislation to go away and modify primary legislation. Now there are limits, so there are within there, for example, it cannot be used to modify the Human Rights Act or the devolution legislation, and there are some restrictions on um, retroactivity, criminal offences and creating lawmaking powers. But nevertheless, it's a very broad transfer of powers that we'd normally see in the hands of the legislature to the executive with affirmative resolution procedure. But of course, that doesn't mean there is the ability to go away and parliamentarians to modify or change these particular provisions. That brings me on to my third concern, which is uh, with regards to democracy. Now, we've already seen concerns as to the speed with which this has been pushed through. So we had an agreement on Boxing Day when most of us would have been hopefully enjoying um, a Christmas break and it was all enacted through in legislation in one day on the 30th of December. So this is incredibly quick process with no real ability to have detailed scrutiny. Not only that, but there is no be no detailed parliamentary scrutiny required over the agreement itself. And you can see this in section 36 of the EU Future Relationship Act, which says that the provisions of the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, where treaties are meant to be laid before Parliament for a period of 21 days, subject to a possibility of a negative resolution procedure, so a vote against them, that has been removed. So these are not needed in order for the uh, CTA it to be ratified. Now, there could be the concern, well, surely that's needed because of the speed, but then we can contrast that with what's going on in Europe. This is an agreement we've agreed to provisionally apply. The European Parliament will be scrutinizing the terms of this agreement. So in an odd situation where the European Parliament has more democratic aspect of control over this than the Westminster Parliament, let alone the devolved legislatures who also will find this having an impact on their lawmaking powers. Not only that, but the EU Future Relationship Committee that is meant to come to an end um, in a few days time has requested a six month extension. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, wrote back to say that the government was not willing to grant that despite specific requests for the extension because the committee wants to uh, question uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lanchester, uh, Lancaster and um, also um, 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 others who've said they can't appear before the committee because there isn't time. So again, you have this element of a lack of detailed democratic scrutiny, which is particularly concerning when you consider how large this agreement is, and all these aspects that are coming out of impacts that people weren't necessarily fully aware of at the time. 
So that leads me very quickly to my final constitutional concern, which is with regard to devolution. Now, again, because it was enacted so quickly, there was, what a surprise, no time to think about the Sewell Convention. There's no ability for there to be legislative consent uh, measures in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So again, you have a lack of involvement from the devolved legislatures in this process and in future scrutiny provisions. There's also within Schedule 5, various lawmaking powers that are granted to the devolved bodies where the UK legislation is setting out what the lawmaking procedure is and the default of the negative resolution procedure with the affirmative for any particular circumstances. And you can add that also to the idea that there's going to be potential future tension because there can be jointly enacted measures and the ability of both the Westminster Parliament and the devolved uh, legislatures to move uh, a motion to ask for that particular provision, that piece of delegated legislation that's been enacted to be annulled. And in those circumstances, the Queen by um, Eldering Council may annul this particular provision. So you can see potential future tensions as there are different motions to annul measures that may or may not be followed. And all of this is quite worrying going forward, particularly uh, as aspects of the agreement come through, when you realise just how little detailed democratic scrutiny there has been over this. I think that for me is probably the main constitutional concern. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you in particular to Alison, who's been so unwell. And I'm very grateful to you for um, coming off your sick bed to um, talk to us today. Um, I now we have um, about 15 uh, minutes of questions. A number of you have put questions um, into the Q&A box. And what I will try to do is direct the questions um, to uh, the relevant um, people um, who have um, arraigned, uh, asked them. And I wonder if I could start with um, uh, Kenneth Armstrong to take the question from Stefano Feller about the fit between um, the part nine of the LPF provisions and a uh, panel of experts. Um, what the, the, in terms of the, the, the panel of experts, um, it looks as if there is an attempt then to have something more specialised, I think, for particularly for, for social and uh, environmental uh, provisions uh, rather than the, the kind of broader arbitration panels uh, for the, the dispute settlement more, more generally. So I think it's part of that kind of degree of specialisation that one also sees within the agreement where not only do you have the partnership council, but you also then have the specialised committees within it. And then those specialised committees setting up more specialised um, panels, which will, will undertake some of the, the, the work here. So I think it's it really is the, the, the fit is the, the point that, that Catherine, you yourself have emphasised between the more general provisions dealing with dispute resolution and the more general mechanisms for arbitration and something much more specialised in these particular policy areas. That's how I see that, but I don't know if others have a different view. Thank you. I, I think for what is, I, I, I agree. And I think what we do see is there is a difference between um, the level playing field provisions um, and the more general uh, compliance with ILO obligations. Um, the first ones um, uh, get the full treatment, so they get um, Article 9.1, 9.2 and 9.3, which are all the panels of experts. But 9.3 allows um, a feedback into the general dispute um, remedy mechanism um, in particular, um, INST 24 and 25, which allows for um, uh, retaliation if um, there is non-compliance. So actually the level playing field provisions are tougher than you might think, or at least potentially tougher than you might think. In respect of the compliance with ILO rules, you only have access to Articles 9192, which is the uh, panel of experts. You don't go into the mainstream um, uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Um, the next question um, I want to pick up on um, from Stefano Fellow is about um, the rather rebarbative nature of the numbering in the text that we're working with at the moment, something that Martin Steinfeld um, referred to. Um, and we know that the final bit of the deal was done in great speed. And we also know that um, there are inconsistencies, that there are 
provisions which are not to don't follow in numerical sequence. We know, know that A's and B's are put in presumably because these provisions were agreed late in the day. Um, but it doesn't make for easy reading. Um, and Lauren, do you have any views whether the scrubbing might turn into something more um, uh, uh, readable? I do. And in fact, the treaty tells us this in Article FinProv 9, uh, a fairly unique provision um, where it says uh, agreement shall be drawn up in all the EU languages, uh, including English. By 30th of April 2021, all language versions of the agreement will be subject to a process of final legal revision. That's what's usually called legal scrubbing. But then we have an interesting second paragraph, the language versions resulting from the above process of final legal revision, which will of course include renumbering, shall replace ab initio the signed versions of the agreement and shall be established as authentic and definitive by exchange of diplomatic notes between the parties, which means any legal scrubbing that now goes on will have effect as of the 1st of January, uh, 2021. So I think the question is what is legal scrubbing? Well, obviously it'll do things like fix the paragraph, uh, the, sorry, the article numbers, which are extremely hard to follow. Um, but I think um, usually what happens there is uh, harmonization uh, between chapters and so on. And of course, when you start messing with words, you mess with the law. And uh, it'd be interesting to see whether there is any actual change that emerges from legal scrubbing. I mean, the, the biggest example of this was, that I know of anyway, was CETA, so the EU-Canada agreement where somewhat famously or notoriously, during the legal scrubbing stage, a completely new form of um, investor state dispute settlement was introduced into the text. In other words, the EU's investment court system uh, was introduced in the text. Now that happened um, before the agreement was actually signed off. So it, it was a, a different stage, but it just goes to show that legal scrubbing can, in theory um, count for quite a bit. Thank you very much for that. It makes you think that uh, it's a bit like washing powder adverts, doesn't it? That things become whiter than white in a different form that you might expect. Um, so thank you. The next question, um, I'll uh, take some from the end as well. Um, does the um, uh, EU Future Relationship Act modify the Internal Market Act um, so as to incorporate the public interest justifications for TBTs available for devolved administrations. Does anyone have any views on that? Kenneth, do you want to have a say? Since I think you've done quite a lot of thinking about this. Yeah, except for that little bit there. Um, I think the in the end, the, the, the Internal Market Act is attempts to deal with internal divergences within within the UK. Of course, to the extent that there is something external that would then constrain those divergences, then they will limit the potential application uh, of the Internal Market Act. Now, the there, there's an issue there about compliance itself by the devolves with those external obligations. Um, the the UK UK ministers can, under the devolution statutes, um, require compliance with with international obligations. So I think the answer to the question is this triangulation between the the the, the limits on divergence, which would be imposed by an external constraint, but then how that external constraint is actually given effect within domestic law. And then its relationship then with the Internal Market Act so it would be that sort of triangulation. Thank you. Does um, Jack or Alison, do you want to add anything to that, Jack? I'm just going to add a, a small footnote. I'm going to assume that there is something which flows down from the international agreement, which is then in conflict with the Internal Market Act. And I obviously have to be careful, given my position, that I don't give advice one way or another. That I genuinely don't know because I haven't read the uh, all 2,000 pages uh, in intricate detail and then compared it to the Internal Market Act. So let me start with that assumption. Uh, you're then asking whether this later act essentially impliedly uh, overturns or uh, trumps the earlier Internal Market Act. Now, what we see in this later act is really very interesting because, and let me get it up on the, the screen again, Section 29 tells us that uh, any earlier law has to be read with such modifications as required. Now, the Internal Market Act is an earlier piece of law, so it would prima facie have to be 
modified in accordance with whatever flows down the, the TCA and then Future Relationship Agreement Act conduit pipe. Uh, so the answer then would be yes, if there is a, a conflict. But apart from this section, there is the Act is entirely silent as to its relationship with other levels of law. Now that's intriguing because as we know from cases like Thoburn, there is the constitutional uh, implied repeal uh, issue by which later acts cannot impliedly overturn earlier ones where the earlier one is constitutional. Now, I think this provision is express enough to over override an earlier statute in relation to the internal market provision, but it, is it express enough to overturn fundamental common law rights or provisions in the uh, two withdrawal acts of 2018 and 2020? I think there's gonna be a lot of litigation as to whether this provision is express enough. And of course, we are, I'm only talking here about section 29. For all of the other provisions, there is absolutely no uh, express mention as to what happens if there is a conflict between this act and other acts. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of litigation about reply, implied repeal and overriding and trumping uh, in relation to this and retained EU law and relevant separation agreement law in the 2020 Act. I touch on these issues uh, teasingly in my very long blog post on the website, but I do so to keep my powder slightly dry in case I'm instructed by claimants or the government because I'm on the AG's panel as well. But I, 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 li I leave that out there that there is an issue and it's a fascinating question. Thank you very much. Um, the next question I want to have a look at um, is, I think, one that Lauren probably has a view on, which essentially says um, if there's no appeal mechanism um, uh, in the TCA, um, which there isn't, um, doesn't that showcase the ineffectiveness um, of the concept of arbitration? Um, well, um, I mean, FTAs don't have appeal mechanisms on trade matters. So it's perfectly normal. Um, for that matter, the WTO doesn't really have an appeal mechanism at the moment, it's got a, a workaround. Um, and we may see it again, uh, if the Biden administration wants to, uh, let's say, unblock its blocking of the WTO appellate body. Uh, so no, I don't think it shows that. I mean, you know, people have different views on how good appeal mechanisms are, um, but I, I don't think it shows that there's any problem with arbitration um itself thank you i think it's probably worth also pointing out that um the 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 the, the, the arbitration tribunal writes uh, an interim report which the parties can um offer their comments on of course that's not appeal but at least it gives the parties a chance to say where they've disagreed um and for the uh, panel to have, an, have another look at it um um, and there's another question again, I think probably more for Lauren, um, and I unfortunately the, the, there's no name against it, but I think the question is essentially um, tariff barriers to trade or non tariff barriers, which the Prime Minister famously said on Christmas Eve, um, it didn't exist under the TCA. Um, we are now discovering that they do exist. Um, are tariff, uh, sorry, are non tariff barriers to trade lawful? Yeah, sure. Um, but um, the assumption is that, that well, non-tariff barrier, I mean, it covers a, a lot of stuff, right? Um, if we're talking about non-tariff barriers that uh, reflect regulation in the public interest, um, the governing principle is necessity that you, sh with some exceptions, um, that you should only be restricting trade in the public interest on various grounds uh, if it's necessary to do that. So you can't just block trade and say, um, you know, vaguely this is uh, this is I think important, but there's no way of demonstrating that it is actually important. Non-tariff barriers can, you know, there's a definitional issue. I mean, it comes from economics. It's anything that's not tariff. It's a terrible term, non-tariff barrier. Actually, it's terrible. Um, but, you know, if we're talking about other things, you know, it could be anything, licensing, whatever, uh, I mean, I can't cover the lot. Um, the point is that you, you, you try to minimise this as much as possible and there's a general necessity principle involved to try and keep tabs on everything. Thank you. Um, Pantelis has asked a question about um, 
essentially are the is the only way to have mutual recognition of professional qualifications going forward um, through the rather laborious process um, laid down by the TCA. Um, or can you have um, uh, individual uh, regulators, professional bodies in France, for example, recognizing the equivalence of the qualifications in the UK? In other words, is this um, uh, is it the only route to go via the TCA route, or can um, backdoor deals essentially be done? Um, Lauren's probably close to you, and I've got a couple of thoughts. Do you want to have, say your thoughts first, Lauren, and then I'll offer you my probably less well informed. I'm going to hand back to you, but I will say one thing which is related to this: um, a question of EU competence. Um, the European Court of Justice has said in the Singapore FTA opinion that mutual recognition forms part of the EU's exclusive competence to regulate matters in trade. That is not how the member states see it. The member states see mutual recognition as being something that they deal with. And it's actually an extremely complicated issue from an EU, EU versus member state constitutional point of view who actually has this competence. I think that probably um, is you know, the, let's say the deeper underpinnings of an answer uh, to this question. I don't have an answer on that. I've looked at it and it confused me and I didn't have time to try and solve it. Uh, but that's as far as, uh, as I can go on that. Um, Catherine, back to you. Yeah, I've, I've, I've also looked at this and I have struggled. I've struggled from the competence perspective because you could say that the very fact that there is the um, terribly complicated EU directive on mutual recognition of professional qualifications that uh, the EU has occupied the field. But on the other hand, um, it's still the member states who specify what qualifications you need to be a lawyer in a particular member state, which would tend to suggest that there is at least shared competence, if not, um, uh, it's, it's not even if it's not full domestic competence. And if you have a look at the provisions in Article Servin 512 and 513, which cover the issue of um, professional um, uh, qualifications, sorry, 513 on professional qualifications, it's, it's not very clear and the footnotes aren't very clear either. There's um, two um, not terribly transparent footnotes, um, which they start for greater certainty, which usually means the opposite. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it does say um, this article should not be construed to prevent the negotiation conclusion of one or more agreements between the parties on the recognition of professional qualifications on conditions and requirements different from those provided for in this article, which seems to create some space. But then the question is, what does parties mean? Parties is written with a capital P. So does that mean parties as in the UK and the EU, in which case that rules out the possibility um, of the French and the UK regulator getting together. Bottom line, Panas, I don't know if you've got a different view, um, is that we just, it's, you can argue it both ways. Um, and I would say I'd heard, and I'm sure I'd read somewhere that um, this, the article serve in 5.13 was deliberately drafted to create the space for um, the UK French regulator to do a deal. Um, but that's not absolutely, I can't see it obviously on the face of the text. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, we are pretty much um, there. Um, I just see, um, Alison, I've just noticed you said you've come up in the chat. Do you want to say something else? Uh, yes, thank you, Catherine. It's just to pick up on some of the points that both John and Martin were mentioning, which is to link it into the uh, terms of reference of the Independent Human Rights Act Review, which were released uh, yesterday. Um, and this is that although uh, they are looking at reviewing the Human Rights Act, the terms of reference at the moment are not looking at withdrawing from the ECHR which may well pick up on John and Martin's points that it's, it's gonna be very difficult to do so now, given the backdrop of these agreements. And the only real potential future clash is they are looking at extraterritoriality, which might end up leading to consequences different from when the European Court of Human Rights would say the Human Rights Act should apply outside of uh, the UK territory. But other than that, it seems to be the, the desire to withdraw from the ECHR is not in the current terms of reference. Uh, Catherine, I think you're muted. <laughs>
thank you. It's quite a lot of noises off. This is a jury of doing everything <laughs> from home. Um, I'm just trying to um, quiet them. So, uh, Martin, do you want to um, uh, answer um, Mr. El Hussein's question about the ratification of the ECHR, an adequate form of human rights protection? And what do we lose out on under the Charter? I'm trying to keep tabs of it, of the questions. That's why I keep looking to my right. Where, where was the question, Catherine? It's just in the Q&A. Basically, the question is, um, does, is mere ratification of the convention enough? Um, what was my what you mean from, from no. a, sorry, Jack, go ahead. Are we talking from a domestic point of view or not? Uh, Jack, what were you going to say first? I was just going to, while you're finding the question, answer the chart a bit um, with, a, with a sneaky footnote, really, which is that although the Act, the 2018 Act, says the Charter is no more. Uh, it doesn't say no more in relation to retained case law, which includes a lot of the rights, of course, that flow through the Charter anyway. So I think there is a backdoor entrance for many of the Charter principles and case law. Yeah, um, and I suppose we could make an argument about citizens protection as well. Um, uh, yes, also just, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have been trying to keep tabs with the questions, but um, if we're talking about the one reference seems to be the pre-98, perspective. Um, in other words, the UK has ratified the convention, but it's not incorporated into domestic law. Well, the, as far as I'm concerned, we just revert to the ex parte sim situation. And if we're in the era of, of, um, of common law constitutionalism, I don't think that this is going to be um, a particular problem in terms of the UK's judiciary incorporating the convention via judicial interpretation and strong interpretive obligations. I, I think that's the essence of the question. But on, on the EU Charter issue as well, I mean, of course, the Charter goes further even than the Human Rights Act in providing mm. a strike down of um, law, uh, as we've seen in a number of cases, uh, even as long as it's within the scope of EU law. But they are various rights. I mean, the right to data protection itself is the fundamental right, but also some of the solidarity rights markets might have a view on this. Um, a sim well even more the solidarity rights are not replicated in the convention. Of course, data protection has a very uh, interesting relationship with uh, Article 8 and the right to private life, so it's less extreme. Of course, this has been an issue for the European economic area even, uh, which is somehow um, following all sorts of EU law, um, paying close attention to the Court of Justice. And yet the Court of Justice uh, case law makes more and more reference to the EU Charter uh, even though um, the EEA countries haven't accepted the EU Charter, and they tend to then still accept them. Of course, that, that's not where we're going to be at, but it, it is complex because some of our secondary legislation, uh, notably the data protection, now the UK GDPR, does uh, it, it incorporate the fundamental right to data protection in many respects, but presumably not to the same extent as having the EU Charter itself. I want to thank you, stop there because we have hit um, three o'clock. Um, I wanted to thank um, all of my colleagues very warmly for their lively contribution. I want to thank the uh, panelists to, uh, and the audience too for um, their very lively participation and their questions. And um, I am sure we shall meet again with future events like this, but thank you very much indeed and good afternoon. <laughs>